Sharks are absolutely incredible animals, being most well known for their remarkable anatomy and fierce reputations, even if the latter point is quite unfounded. But something that often gets overlooked is shark reproduction, something that's given the extraordinary diversity of this group is highly variable, and something that I believe deserves some much needed attention if we are to appreciate and understand these animals in the goal to conserve them. To start this video off, it is important to know all of the different modes of reproduction these animals go through, with there being three distinct ways of bearing their young. Most sharks, around 70%, bear live young, with this method of reproduction being separated into two groupings of sharks, those that have a placenta and those that don't. The first of these methods through bearing their pups is through oviviviparity meaning that the eggs of the shark hatch in the oviducts within the mother's body, with the remnants of the egg's yolk and fluids being secreted by glands in the wall of the oviduct, nourishing the embryos as they grow, and has been described as a bridging form of reproduction between egg-laying, oviparous and live-bearing reproduction. This form of reproduction is notable, as those in the order Lamniforms practice something known as oophagy, where after the embryos hatch, eat the remaining eggs and are then supplied with a continuous amount of unfertilized eggs for some extra sustenance before they are born. Tawny nurse sharks remarkably have been noted to take this to the next level, moving between the left and right uteri, which sharks remarkably possess, and in some cases have been known to migrate a total of 24 times across the duration of a pregnancy, and at quite the speed of 8 centimetres per second. This was the first reliable evidence of active embryonic locomotion in live-bearing vertebrates, and is entirely contradictory to the concept of the sedentary embryo, which has mainly arisen from studies on mammals. Taking this even further is the case of the survival strategy of sand tiger shark embryos, which are known to cannibalistically consume neighbouring live embryos a process known as intrauterine cannibalism, or adelphophagy, eating one's brother. Female sand tigers with their two uterine horns may have as many as 50 embryos, that's when one of the embryos in each of the horns reaches around 10 centimetres in length, eats all the small embryos that it can find so that only one large embryo remains in each uterine horn. These surviving embryos then continue to feed on a steady supply of unfertilised eggs, and after a lengthy labour, the female gives birth to two one metre long, fully independent offspring, with an overall gestation period of approximately 8 to 12 months. These sharks are notable in that they give birth only every second or third year, resulting in an overall mean reproductive rate of less than one a pup per year, one of the lowest reproductive rates for sharks, the implications of which I will get to shortly. The process of adelphophagy is both fascinating and frightening, and the reason it happens makes the process even more unique. It has been noted in many species of shark that a single litter of pups can have anywhere from one to five fathers, and if a male does encounter a female, will attempt to mate even if there may be no need for the female to do so. Because of this, embryos conceived from different fathers will go after the embryos that are distinct to them in an attempt to strengthen their bloodline as known from DNA testing, so that their genes can be passed on. The next form of bearing young is through viviparity, where the young are gestated without the use of an egg, and like the previous method, results in a live birth, with viviparity occurring when once the yolk sac has been depleted, it attaches to the uterine wall, acting as a pseudoplacenta, which transfers nutrients and oxygen to the embryos from the female's bloodstream, and then transfers waste products from the developing pups back to the mother for elimination. This process occurs in hammerheads, the requiem sharks like the bow and blue sharks, as well as the smooth hounds, with the young being born fully formed and ready to fend for themselves. And interestingly, shark uteruses do in fact produce a substance that is secreted to provide nourishment to the young, which is known as uterine milk, although it is quite unlike the milk that mammals produce. The last method that's being through egg laying is known as being oviparous, sharks which lay their fertilised eggs in the water, which continue to develop from there. In most oviparous shark species, an egg case with the consistency of leather protects the developing embryos, which is hardened as it makes contact with seawater, and varies in terms of shape and coloration depending on the species. 
Also known as mermaids and or devil's purses, these egg cases often possess long tendrils that help them to attach to seaweed or rocky seafloors, and may even be corkscrewed into crevices for protection by the parent, so that the eggs do not get washed away by ocean currents. Examples of sharks that lay external eggs include the horn, cat, port jackson and swell sharks, and you may have even come across a few of these egg cases yourselves after they have washed up on beaches. I know I most certainly have. While these are the main forms of shark reproduction and brooding, there is a fourth option that can occur, which is through parthenogenesis, a form of asexual reproduction in where a female shark is able to conceive a pup without being in contact with a male. While the details of this process are not well understood, genetic fingerprinting has shown that the pups produced by this method had no paternal genetic contribution, ruling out sperm storage. This process is extremely rare, and is likely utilised as a last-ditch effort to reproduce when a mate is not present, as there is no fertilisation of the eggs like in sexual selection. Asexual reproduction only introduces genetic variation into a population if a random mutation in the organism's DNA is passed on to the offspring, leading to diminished genetic diversity which otherwise helps in a boosting of variation and thus the health of a population. This process also tends to produce fewer pups, and has been noted to occur in the blacktip, hammerhead and zebra sharks. As mentioned earlier, the time it takes for the brooding of offspring and how often these animals reproduce has clear implications for their survival, in that as many utilise the case strategy of reproduction, it means that they have few but well-developed offspring, putting a lot of efforts into their pups. This is, however, a slow method of breeding, as gestation periods can average between 9 to 12 months in some sharks and up to 18 to 24 months in the case of dogfish. They also often mature slowly and therefore are only able to breed after a sufficient amount of time, with an extreme example being found in the Greenland sharks, which are capable of living for 400 years, but don't start to reproduce until they are around 150 years of age and a more moderate example in the case of lemon sharks take around 13 to 15 years. It's also important to note that some species don't reproduce every year, with some not being able to be pregnant for one to two years after delivering young or laying eggs. The wide diversity of mating habits, gestation, rituals and habitats means that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution for protecting sharks, and given how tens of millions of these incredible animals are being unsustainably and cruelly killed for medicinal purposes and sustenance, as well as through habitat degradation, it is key to understanding the reproduction of these animals so that we can better conserve them and to ensure that their populations have a chance to recover, so that more people can encounter and learn about these animals. With that said, I hope you enjoyed this video on the intricacies of shark reproduction and learn something new about these animals. If you want to see more on these incredible fish, I would highly recommend checking out the annual Shark Week videos on the channel Benji Thomas, who have once again produced some great content that I'm sure you will all enjoy if you haven't seen them already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.